all right, so we're done with nitrogen. For now, we're gonna have to re-evac this system, which isn't a problem. That over the weekend vacuum hold, that was pretty impressive for a system with two known leaks. Okay, let's just drain this nitrogen out. I thought we were gonna be done with this car today. I gotta take this line back off. Hopefully I'll still be able to reuse that O-ring that I just used. I should be able to. It was only on there momentarily. You know, one of the things I liked about this compression fitting is I was able to make adjustments on the line to have this line up for me. Sorry, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, you need a compressor now. And think about how south this, this job went. You fixed a leak on the condenser. It lasted one day. It came back, you found a line that was leaking. Didn't find any other leaks. You changed that line. We had at least three hours labor in that. You're done with that part and you say to the customer, I'm sorry, you need a compressor now. Guess who's not happy with you? Mr. or Mrs. Customer is not happy with you. You are a rip-off artist. You get a one-star Google review. You guys that are doing air conditioning work on old cars like this, you better tread carefully. Document everything. Good, clear communication with your customer. That's the only way that you're gonna avoid an issue. Wait, let's do something here first. I'm gonna mark this. Uh oh, I can't get it wrong. The upper parts, two hoses are right next to each other. But in cases like this, it's never a bad idea to mark a housing. And don't use paint, scratch it. <laughs> we learned that with the line we tried to mark. Didn't we, Caleb? This O-ring right here. This is what I need. I need an O-ring. <laughs> I should have cleaned this. See all the debris right there? Mm -hmm. Ah, damn. Some other O-rings there too. O-ring right there. O-ring right there. How many times have I rebuilt a compressor in my life, Caleb. You wanna know? Zero. Zero. Oh, we should do them all while we're there. This one, this one, and this one. There's three of them. Okay, I gotta see what I can come up with online. I'll get some compressor numbers. For now, I'm gonna bolt this back up. Not bolt it back up. I'm just gonna just put the top back on loosely. Don't they have like O-ring in a can? I need Dr. O-ring for Dr. O-ring fix. Can't even get that back on. Nobody's gonna have an O-ring that size e either, you know? Go to the parts store and be like, give me this O-ring. Wow, that has specifics. Okay, so it sits, these four notches go in here. That's what I'm fighting. I if there's an orientation there. Yeah. What else am I missing? Yeah. Uh, there was a gap there though. Was there? Yeah, but I can still see the O-ring. So that's not right. Uh, let's go to the workbench, Caleb. So we, are we ready for a, a bad job to get worse? <laughs> I wish I would have had this on camera. I sent Caleb upstairs 
just so I could clean off my workbench and I had an issue I think we left off where I just couldn't get this line back up it wouldn't seat all the way and so um it has these like spring-loaded like fingers here and I'm like all right those are pretty pretty heavy duty like I can't move those so I'm kind of you know made sure my orientation was right you can see the um that that part right there sits right here and then there's a cutout right here that kind of accounts for that bolt and you can see kind of a a trail there and I'm cranking it down and thinking I'm compressing these springs and then all of a sudden dude it literally snapped the compressor housing in half and then I believe what was happening I'm not totally sure cuz everything looked okay um, these tabs right here, here and here, either this, either this wave plate or this is kind of your reed valves for the compressor. Either those guys moved on me, and it was sitting, it was sitting crooked um, there, or it was the slots here and here, those tabs, and it's possible that that wasn't sitting down all the way. It was kind of sitting upward a little bit, and I didn't notice that. And when I cranked it down, that small little quarter of an inch is what I needed for this to seat all the way. And I just put too much pressure on it. And, and literally, it didn't take a lot. It literally pulled the entire compressor, snapped the compressor. So our debate on whether or not we can get these O-rings is irrelevant now because I need a compressor. Um, in any case, um, we can see the inside of the compressor, right? Sure. Kind of neat. There's your pistons. <laughs> and then we can literally take the guts out of this entire thing. Although it looks like we got a wire here that's holding us up. Let me take that off real quick. Just so we can look. I really screwed up, Caleb. I really screwed up. I mean if this is a if this is a customer's car, at this point you were probably selling a compressor already. I'm not even going to approach this anymore from a billing standpoint. <laughs> you can see how much this is just a, an all around, all around losing job. 100%. Looks like it's going to cost me about 300 bucks if I can find, if I can get one. I can get a remanufactured one for about 280. The worst part about this too, Caleb, is I don't even have an option to put this back together for your brother. Uh, I guess I could take just take the AC belt off and you could drive it, but yeah, I don't know if that drives a water pump or not. <laughs> Look at all that crap in there. Anyway, this is your your retrofit type stuff. Look at all that. That's nasty. That's like all through the system too. When you retrofit AC systems, R12 to R134A, it's a wobble plate type compressor. They call that a wobble plate. So as it turns, this is actually a six cylinder compressor. You have three on this side and three on this side. As that wobble plate turns, it moves the piston. So your focus is right here. Actually, you maybe kind of get it right here at the piston. As that wobble plate turns it, uh, compress compresses the one side discharges the other or compresses the one side intake on the other you know and they just flip flop there's nothing wrong with this compressor too man even though you had all that crap in there the bore area of the of the cylinders it, it still looks pretty good in spite of the color of that fluid but man did i screw up uh we'll be back when we have a new compressor so R and R Auto Recycling in West Newton, PA, is bailing me out on this AC compressor. They have one, 50 bucks. We're going to get it right now. And uh, I did an online search. These things are not available anywhere. I mean, people selling them on eBay, 200 ish in that range. Um, and uh, parts, as far as parts being available for these, not a chance. Not a chance. So. Even though I broke it, we weren't gonna get those O-rings anyway. And uh, I still feel really dumb about what I did, but you know, these are, hey, we're learning together, man. I told you, how many AC compressors did I tell you guys I've rebuilt in my life? <laughs> what did we say, Caleb? Zero. 
zero. <laughs> now you can see why. You can see why. Sometimes I have that mechanic touch, which is no touch at all. I got a compressor, it's in the bed of the truck. It's a little bit tight when I turn it, but I was just thinking about that. Like, worst case scenario is I have a good housing now and we can take the guts out of Jake's and put it in that one if we need to. And then you can break another well, compressor. Well then, yeah, then I can break another compressor, but then I'll need seals if we do that. So then but we have options. For 50 bucks, I ended up giving him 60. For 60 bucks, I'm good. I have a housing. That's that's the most important part. So hopefully we can just bolt it up and it doesn't leak. And he said it was sitting on the shelf for five years. <laughs> we'll definitely put some oil in it and, and uh, see how it goes. So let's go back to the house and fix this damn Nissan. Get it out of my driveway. So a couple things. One, the uh, terminal's cut off. So I'll, I'll replace that end. Um, and I just cleaned the label off so we could see that. But what I don't like, and I saw this on the counter, when you see that, what's that an indication of? Bad things. <laughs> That's an indication of a, a leak, leak. Of a leak. <laughs> and like we might be in the same boat. At least though, I have a housing that I can deal with. I still might have to get O-rings for this. Oh, um, but the stuff. other thing too that I noticed now is that when I was tightening that, and this is the problem with, with not paying attention when you pull things apart, you look at the gap that's in here. I assumed incorrectly that that section should be flush with this, and I kept going. I just kept tightening it. And I'm looking at this now, and that part, I had it right. It was seated. And I just apparently I had to be flushed too. I, I mean, it's, it's definitely not look at the gap between there and where the, you know, the stud or bolt comes through. It's like, man, I just over tightened it and broke it. Literally. If you over tighten that those, it pushes the entire housing and breaks it. That sucks. Now maybe we'll get lucky. And this is just like oil from something else. Like maybe, maybe like one of these lines were leaking and it leaked down the side, you know, like this one here and all of this debris, but this part, that doesn't, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. I'll tell you what I'm not doing. I'm not going to pull it under a vacuum first to see if it holds. I'm going to put it under pressure immediately. And some of you guys are wondering too, how much oil do we put in this? I mean, look how much oil came out of that compressor. That's about it, like an ounce. You change a compressor, that's all you're talking about. Put that back on. Let's clean this up. Are you kidding me? Did it just become righty loosey? Damn it! Mother look at that! <laughs> Took the freaking threads right out! What's wrong with you, Danner? I was watching uh, too. I was like, he's really torquing that. That was too much! Now, fortunately, that does go all the way through almost. I might be able to grab some threads inside. Oh, I was so dumb! Dude. <laughs> watch out, watch out. Is that the right thread? That is not. That's a standard thread. Which might actually be helpful. And kind of force it in there. <laughs> we'll see. Nice, <laughs> nice. Don't touch it. That's good. It's got other mounting points, but that's good. I'm happy with that. Dude, what's wrong with me? I'm like, I'm breaking everything today. I'm like that new hire that if you're a garage owner and you hire a guy and everything he touches, he breaks. That's like me today. All right, let's get a little bit of oil in this. This is just a little bit tighter than that actually feels better. The more we're the more I'm moving it. 
And we're definitely going to use ester oil. Any oil that I put in here, I'm actually going to drain back out. You don't want to have liquid in a compressor when you first start it. You cannot compress a liquid. So you don't want oil in your compressor, any volume anyway. It's like nothing coming out of there. Well, let's fix this wire. This job went south the day it left, left the shop. Yeah, this is my son's car for you guys tuning in now. This customer is not mad. It's my son. He understands. If you have a good long rapport with a customer, you've had them for years, they'll understand. If this is a new customer and you didn't communicate well, yeah, you're going to lose on this one. You're going to lose on this one. And you're also, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you can avoid that one-star review. It helps if you've changed the customer's diapers. It does help. <laughs> it does help if you've changed the customer's diapers. <laughs> All right, let's get this back on the car and hopefully we don't have a leak in this back seal. If we do, then I'm gonna have to try to find a seal kit, which I doubt. And I did, you guys missed this off camera. I took the wire wheel to that belt groove and cleaned up the heavy rust on that. The belt will do the rest. So I guess before I finish bolting all of that up, we should, let's, let's bolt this all back up. All right, before I finish tightening everything, I'm going to put these lines back on and we're going to air, we're going to pressure check this. I told Jake what was going on through text. He's like, I'll give you money for it. I'm like, no, he doesn't know that I'm the one that broke it. <laughs> and like I said, though, I, I doubt I'm going to find a seal kit for this. So if this one's leaking, we're going to have a problem. If we have no initial leak, we're absolutely going to do a much longer pressure decay test. I am not relying on that micron gauge to tell me that. I've never relied on vacuum in the past to say that we're good. And I thought the micron gauge was gonna be the, the separating factor in that. And that it was gonna you know, provide me with that much accuracy to be able to confirm there's no leak without repressurizing. Oh yeah, I don't need this one. We'll go with just the high side because I don't want to put that kind of pressure to that micron gauge. Let me grab my tank. In my rush to do this, I forgot to add oil. I want to add a little bit more oil to this system, but we can do it the way we did before. We'll just suck it in. Fingers crossed. Pressure. That's 200 and we dropping fast. <laughs> Let's put some more in it. That's 200. It's dropping quickly. Where, where's the leak? That's at 150 and holding now. It's possible I'm just so like hyper aware of a leak that like when I'm adding the nitrogen I'm kind of 
adding it from the valve first and it hasn't fully filled the system yet and so that rapid drop is because of that and then i really just need to keep going a little bit that's a 200 now yeah so is that just me being a little bit too quick on making that call i hope that makes sense like i have an empty empty system and i'm pumping all that pressure in here and i'm i'm not filling from the low side i'm filling from the high side and it's hitting that gauge first before it goes down into the system. And so pressure's high before it kind of squeezes into the system. And I think, I think that's exactly what it was. I, I think I normally, when I do this, I would, I would probably add from the low side and then watch the high side gauge, which would be after the effect. So we're putting in the low side, filling the system, and then the gauge is the last thing in line instead of the first thing in line. And I jumped the gun. It looks good. This looks good. That is holding. I'm still just above 200, you know, depending on the angle of your camera, that's going to look like 200. But from my angle, that that's sitting there just above 200 and it's not moving. Yeah. So now I'm going to keep uh, bolting this up and then we're going to do we're going to do a compressor uh, compression ratio test. If you guys remember that test, that's going to be really important for us with this used compressor to make sure that it's able to do its job. I don't want to charge this system only to find out that this used compressor could potentially have a problem internal, you know, with one of the reed valves, it spins freely. So we should be good on that front, like the wobble plate and everything that you guys saw and the pistons, like it, the travel was good, but you could always have a, a valve issue and the compressor cannot do its job. Although if you remember when I was turning it, putting my finger over the hole and then letting go, you heard like a like pressure. So that was a good sign. How's my compression fittings looking? That looks good. I don't like those small bubbles though, but that could have just been me. Let's redo that one. Watch that for a second. Nope, that looks good too. Get the V-belt back on. So we could have run this without the AC compressor, by the way. I just said, would have had to take the alternator belt off first or power steering belt off first. And then I could have taken this belt off. That belt does not drive the water pump. At least I have part number now, an exact part number, if I ever need to get seals for this compressor, because my other one did not have this tag anymore. Yeah, I have a digital photo of it. You gotta stop saying digital photo. You sound elderly. I, ha I have a. I think you took it on film. I, I, I have a picture of it. I only was making a distinction between your camera and my phone. I have a phone picture. Yes, Can I say yeah, phone picture? These are digital pictures too. <laughs> Shut up, Caleb. <laughs> okay, so I can't really run this without the mass airflow. This system's stupid. I don't think it'll even run for me to do the compressor test we could try it i don't need it to run good i just need it to run momentarily so i can start this compressor all right let's get my low side gauge on this let's take this off here Useless. we got a schrader valve there we'll utilize that for the rest of this all right low side high side pressures what we want to see is low side drop drastically and the high side increase drastically. Now I'm at 200. I got to say, I've never done this compressor test with 200. I've only done it with like 150 because I used to do it with shop air all the time. So I'm going to lower this. We'll get this down to 150. I want my high side down at like 150. Okay. All right. I don't think this is going to start and run, but I'm going to try it. And then I'll turn the AC on. We'll run it briefly. See what kind of pressures we get. You ready? Like 35. 
hell yeah, to get 250 on the high and 35 on the low. You know, that compressor is great. That makes me feel wonderful, all warm and fuzzy inside. Um, before I pull this back under a vacuum, add oil to this, because I'm gonna add another ounce. I might actually put two ounces in this. And the reason I say that is because I replaced the line and the compressor, and generally an ounce for the compressor, and if I'm changing a line, I'm gonna put an ounce in for that. So we'll do two more ounces of oil. Uh, lots of questions on the last video about how much oil to add, and there's really no good way to answer that. You change and add oil based on the components, and you also add oil based on a leak. Some of you are thinking you had a big leak there, and so you probably lost a lot of oil, and that's just not the case. When you lose refrigerant that quickly, you're not losing much oil. I think when you lose a decent amount of oil is when you have a very slow, gradual leak over time. Um, and you know, that's you know, gonna be up for debate as far as how much oil you lose on a leak. I've also, over the years, when doing recovery systems, doing repairs in a shop where we have a recovery machine, the machine actually has the ability to measure the amount of oil that you removed from the system on an evac. So on a pulling the stuff out, we call that an uh, evacuation or an evac. And I have to tell you, I stopped measuring the oil when I was done because there never was any. Pulling all the refrigerant out with a machine, I would never really pull the oil out. So how much oil did we lose with the, the hose leak after we added oil from our last repair? I'm saying not much at all, okay, if any. And then, so we changed the compressor and we changed the line. How much oil do we wanna add? I'd say an ounce for that compressor and an ounce for that line. But honestly, it, it needs this low side line done. We talked about that. It needs the other low side line done on the other side. It, it could use a, a new receiver dryer and then if you're gonna go that far, I would recommend flushing the evap core, flushing the condenser out, getting rid of all of the oil that's in that system, all of that old mineral oil, and then starting fresh with a full system charge of oil, which I believe when I looked it up was about six ounces. Now this, this job and where we are to spend 50 bucks on a compressor, I'm happy about that. And it's the same day and we can get this car done, get it out of here. It's an old car. All right, let me, let me put some uh, more nitrogen in this because I want to do one final pressure check. And this time I have my micron gauge removed. We'll add to the low side. I'll keep the high side closed. When these are threaded in, tightened, right? Loosen, tighten. When you tighten those, you're opening the Schrader valve here. So now any pressure in the system can go into, into the lines. Up here, it's a little bit different. When you close these valves off, you're still sending that pressure up to the gauge. You're not isolating the gauge. What you're doing with these is you're opening or closing the yellow hose to the red hose, the yellow hose to the blue hose when you have these open. If you have them both open, pressures from low and high extend through the gauge set into the yellow hose and they're all three connected when both are open. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna keep this one closed so when I put my nitrogen in, it's gonna go into the blue side, fill up the system, and now the last thing in line is gonna be my high side gauge. We're not gonna see that same thing we saw when we added to the high side. It's not important, really, I'm just pointing out a variable. So if I, if I add and then stop, you see how the high side isn't dropping like it was? Yeah. Every time I'd stop before the high side would drop. Yeah. It was very misleading. All right, we're gonna go to 200. Okay, so I'm closing that off, closing that off, making sure these are all tight. Down here, make sure these are tight. Make sure that's tight. And now we're gonna do our decay test. And what that's gonna involve, I'm gonna walk away from this for 15 minutes. I wanna see what that looks like. I'm just a hair above 200 right now. When I come back, it should be right there. Actually, instead of walking away, um, I will probably, I'll just have Caleb turn the camera off, but I'm gonna start bolting this air intake back on so we're ready to go and we can recharge and be done with this thing. Um, we will have to, we have some time though involved because when I pull it back under a vacuum, I, I need to evac it for, you know, 35, 40, 
30 to 45 minutes. I had some HVAC guys insist 45 minutes and I don't think that that time is set in stone. I think it matters where you live. I think if you live in Arizona and you have single digit outside air uh, humidity levels, percentage wise, you don't have to evac it as much as someone does in Florida. I don't think that time is set in stone on what is required for an evac. It's been like an hour. Take, just get a shot of this gauge, Caleb, before you go, and then I'm gonna pull this under a vacuum. Quick, this battery is about to die. Yeah, this, it's still sitting at 200. It was just a hair above before, but I lost the tiniest bit because I took the low pressure gauge off. And I've been on this for an hour, putting this back together. Most ridiculous air intake ever, once again. Uh, but I'm gonna finish that part. I'm good with the pressure test. We're gonna, um, while Caleb's running out to the store, I'm gonna pull this under a vacuum for the next 45 minutes. We'll get a final micron gauge reading after we do that, and then we'll recharge it. Oh, well, Caleb left us. I thought you guys might wanna see this part. So we're pulling the system down now. Make sure all of our fittings are tight. And then, of course, I forgot my oil again. I'm gonna add, we're gonna go 50 milliliters. Uh, 59 milliliters is two ounces, so I'm just gonna go just a little bit under that. Again, I'm gonna pull it through the high side. Then we'll continue evac and through the low side. Some of you asked me the last time, well, how, how do you make sure that you're not pulling that oil back out? And, you know, one of the things, again, that doesn't really happen it won't pull it back out but just to be sure we will go close this off so now we're continuing to pull vacuum on this side into the low side of the system we're pulling from here and I'm going to put the oil in here so I'll take my line off of the high side right here yes I'm pulling air in right now but so what the whole system has been open to air forever and we'll just pull that in. And the system's been open up to the atmosphere for a while. That compressor was open to the atmosphere for a while. That little bit I pulled in there is not hurting anything. You all need to relax. Relax. All right, so I'll keep that closed. I'll keep this closed. So we'll continue to pull from this side just to make sure we're not pulling anything out of that's residual in the hose. And uh, then, then what I'll do is when we charge this, again, if I, if I forget, I'll first put a little bit in this high side line so I can blow any of the oil that's in that line into the system. And then, uh, then the rest of the way, you know, with the car running or whatever, however we decide to charge it, we'll go low side if the car's running. If we use hot water, we can charge either side. Um, what else do I want to address? Because there was a lot of questions on how, how do we make sure that we're not pulling the oil back in. And there's not really a flow in the system. So, you know, one of the things about pulling that oil back out that I just pulled in, think about it, I pulled it in because I had flow in through the red nozzle and then, um, or sorry, this side, in through the red line and into the system on its way all through the system out the blue side and then into the vacuum pump. But with both lines connected, you really don't have that flow. We're just pulling on the system and there's really no draw of like airflow for that oil to move. And that's really why you're not pulling that oil out. I could pull and open this high side line right now and it's not gonna pull that oil out. So just kind of watching this micron gauge dropping. I still like the micron gauge, uh, but I am not making this gauge the be all end all for me. I had no leaks on a vacuum for two and a half days. It held 500 microns for two and a half days. All right, we're back down to 520 microns. That is a good thing. If you guys remember, when we take this off of here, we want to have this compressor running. But before I do that, back up here real quick, Caleb. Turn these off. 
I did end up opening that high side line back up for a while and I did not pull any oil out. Gauges don't matter here. The micron gauge tells us what we need to know. Not turning the AC or the vacuum pump off. I think I called it a compressor again. Taking, taking this off here, then shutting it off. Utilizing this check valve right here. <clears throat> From here, we can do a quick decay test. Not that it matters. Now we're down to 510. I don't care at all about this vacuum decay. The pressure check told me everything I want to know. I mean, we can use this as a guide really for moisture is the key, but that's good. I'm fine with that. And so some tips that I learned from you guys. Remember I was worried about the micron gauge and, and then we ended up like pinching off a line with vice grips and I know you guys didn't like that. What a suggestion was, and I liked it, one of you guys said this, is blow a little refrigerant in it, just a tiny bit, enough to get rid of the vacuum to at least get to just above atmospheric air pressure, and then you can take your micron gauge off. And that way, when I take this off, there's a Schrader valve underneath here, vacuum won't pull the Schrader in and any air, which I don't think it would anyway on this one, because it's pretty heavily spring-loaded, but this way, when I put a little bit of refrigerant in, then I won't have that pressure differential and then I can take my micron gauge off. So we're gonna do that. I do want to do this one quickly. It's the end of the day. You guys saw how we charged it with hot water before. I'm not doing any of that. I'm charging it with the system. And before I do that, I wanna address something that is concerning uh, to many of you and, and the procedures that I'm using. Number one, we have a check valve right here, right? We don't want any atmospheric air getting in there. Number two, this can tap, which is the newer style can tap. Let me grab a can. With these newer cans, there's a rubber tip in there. So this valve, it isn't poking a hole in it like the older ones did. It's depressing that rubber tip. And the thing about this, when it is um, tightened clockwise, it pulls the valve out. And so it essentially closes that. With it counterclockwise, you see it, that needle goes down and then depresses that valve. So let's be clear about this valve in either full direction. Listen, I have flow. Go this direction with it. I have flow. So me closing this valve off is not the answer for me changing from one can to the next. I'm still gonna get air in this section. The other thing, my valve does not fit this. So I bought this adapter that accomplishes that for me. And there is a check valve or Schrader valve right there. So when I switch from can to can, right, I'm gonna take the line off here first, utilizing this check valve to trap everything in there, not let air in, and then utilizing this check valve too for anything left in the can. The problem is, and I cannot overcome this, is when I switch from can to can, it doesn't matter the position of this valve, I'm gonna have at, um, atmospheric air that has the ability to come into this section. As I was rambling, got a little rise there, but that's okay, I am not worried at all. All right, so I just threaded this on here. And one of the things that you can do if you're concerned about that small amount of air right there, because of the way these are designed, and with this Schrader, I'm now opening that can. Just take your finger and do this. There you go, purged of that section. Connecting this up. I'm gonna add as a liquid, so I'm gonna go upside down because the car is not running right now. Over here, we're gonna blow into the high side first because that's the side I put oil in. And I'm just gonna go a little bit. Now, I can take this off. So, I, I just utilized that check valve for the rest of this. Micron gauge is now removed. A little bit better than what we did last time. 
and we're good to go from this point. Let's go. Let's blow it. Should be able to see liquid going in this sight glass right here, Caleb. All right, if you guys remember, this took three cans. We debated that last time. We used the sight glass over here. I'll show you that in a minute. Shaking the can just to see how much is in it. Still some in there. Closing off my high side. You never want to add to the high side with the car running. I'm now going to open the low side up. We're going to finish charging from the low side. Uh, actually, I'm going to close that while I start the car. Then we want to be careful adding. You know, we are sending some liquid through here. That liquid's going straight to the compressor. This line right here, Caleb, this is your suction line. So we're pulling in and that's pulling in right here. So we want to be real careful adding as a liquid with the engine running because we're adding right to the compressor. If that low side straighter valve was over on the other side, like on an accumulator, we could be much less careful about it. We could just blow it in. Uh, but in this case, we do want to be careful. And so I'll add a little bit at a time. All right, that can is empty. So what I want to do first, I want to separate it here because of this check valve. I still have my low side line open. That's okay. I have a check valve here. Take this can off of here. There'll be some very small amount left. <clears throat> Switching bleed the air out right here and let me close this because I have that valve open I don't want to just dump liquid in here just yet all right now we're gonna open this up you see that increasing in pressure I'm adding as a vapor right now if you kind of keep an eye on this and the sight glass you'll kind of get what I'm doing you see liquid go in there so I just want to do that kind of carefully just because of where that compressor is in relation to the service port. You can, you can add as a vapor the whole time. It just takes a really long time. And I just want to get done. But once we have pretty much vapor left, it, it gets really, really cold right at the end. That is empty. Again, I don't need to close that valve, but I will anyway. Closing that. High side's been closed the whole time. We don't want to ever add to the high side running. Still got bubbles in the sight glass. Okay, going after the third can. I'm gonna watch my sight glass over here as I'm adding. As soon as we get the right amount of refrigerant in here, we're gonna see that sight glass clear up. Remember we debated the refrigerant amount with the R134A and the numbers we got on the internet as far as our conversions, we were light. Presser just turned off. There we go. Clear sight glass. And that's like right at the end of that can. And at idle, we're at 200 and on the high side, just over 200, 30 on the low, just above 40. I'm good with that. That's a fix. Jake's gonna be a happy camper. Right. Just kind of look at those gauges for a 1500 RPM. I'm gonna see where we're at. We've got to worry about cooling fan issues if we start seeing this guy climb too high. All right, that looks good. These are both closed. These are both open right now. Step one, take your high side straighter, close it. So unwind this. What we've just done is we've trapped that 250 PSI in that red line. Step two, open. Don't forget, you got to have this check valve to do this. Open your high side port that just blew all that high pressure into my yellow hose next step open this up slowly we're gonna pull all that in, that's in the center yellow hose you see all that liquid in there it's the from the red hose and yellow hose we're pulling that into the low side of the system and now we have 30 and 30 on the gauges and before we shut the car off we open this one which closes the straighter and now we've trapped that in here. Now we shut the car off. And now we take our gauges off. And you can wait if you want to on the high side to let that pressure equalize. And that's why you wait. I was just being impatient. Last part, we checked these Schraders last time. 
the last part for us. Refrigerant, when you're using leak detectors, um, especially in sunlight, I believe, but you wanna go below the lines, right? You wanna go below the lines. And so that's what I'm, you're gonna see me do as best I can. Now, I can't really go below the line if it's sitting this way, right? But I, I know that it's heavier and it will drop, okay? So that's the key in using this. And the first thing we wanna do is this top, this top compression fitting right here. I just wanna make sure that that guy is not leaking at all. And then I'll go bottom of the compressor, that lower seal, like this seal that we were dealing with before, I'm gonna go underneath. Good, one more check. So I'm on it, I'm just, just right near that compression fitting, kind of right underneath it. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us on this one, guys. I know that you will like this follow-up. We thank you, our community, for giving us tips. And we actually applied some of them to this one. Uh, we answered some questions for you guys about the Micron gauge and how much we trust it. Uh, we also talked about uh, it being a good moisture indicator and maybe, you know, there was debate on if it was a good decay tester or not. I still think it is, of course, it's real sensitive. But I, I know that this follow-up will help you Tread carefully with your used cars, old cars like this one, as far as doing AC repair, communicate with your customer is key. We talked about that all along the way. And how about those compression fittings that we got? I want to be clear, there is no affiliate here with me and this company. I, out of desperation, I did a Google search and I found these fittings in this company that makes them. We'll put them in the description of this video so you guys can use them too if you need to. I am very pleased with these compression fittings and I will update you guys too. I have nothing to hide here. This company's not paying me. We found them, paid regular prices for the hose and I'm happy with it. It allowed me to, to make movements in the line when I was finished, where when you're using a press and, and a compression, not compression uh, fittings, but like a, a press type fitting or a welded fitting, you can't make adjustments. You better make sure that you mark those lines and have them oriented right. With this design, I was able to make those final adjustments on the car, so I really like that. And for me, I don't do a lot of air conditioning work, so it doesn't make sense for me to tool up and go on Amazon and buy a press. You can get a press for $150, $175 and get the fittings and you can fix them if you have the right fittings. To me, this setup, this is the way I'll go in the future too, with, especially with older cars. Now, if I can get the line, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, but I know this is really helpful for you guys to have this option. Guys, thank you again so much. I look forward to your comments in this one. You can make fun of me. It's okay. We'll see you next time.